Wow. Well, today we are going to talk about gentleness. More specifically, we're talking about this Greek word, protes. Yeah, that's cool. Um, there's really no good English translation for this word. It is a huge concept, and so we have tried to translate it really hard, and a lot of scholars came up with the word gentleness. But it's just hard for us to wrap our heads around. So today we're going to try <laughs> to dive in to Galatians 5, 22 and 23 when saying, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, or protes, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Since it's God's spirit that embodies this fruit perfectly and also produces it in us, we're just going to begin with some prayer by talking to him. So, dear Lord, we thank you for embodying every one of these aspects. Um, Lord, you are kind and gentle and self-controlled and good, and you never waver in that. Um, Lord, we specifically ask you today to reveal to us what, what your gentleness looks like and to help cultivate that in us. Amen. If you ask my parents to describe me growing up, gentleness would for sure not be a word that they used. <laughs> uh, when I was six, my youngest sister, Dee, was born, and I was instantly enamored with her cute little self. I resonate a lot with Agnes from Despicable Me. I don't know if you guys have watched that. <laughs> yes. um, but she sees this stuffed unicorn and she's like, it's so fluffy, I'm going to die. And it's like an aggressive mm. kind of love. And um, that actually, there's a term for that feeling. It's called cuteness aggression. Mm. And I feel it deeply when I look at Dee. Dee is that unicorn to me. Mm. Look at her. <laughs> like, she's just so cute. And I just want to like grab her face and yell nice things at her because she's just so cute. <laughs> So as you can tell, from a very young age, I was told to be gentle. <laughs> um, and that continued on when I was in high school. My tone was a little spicy, I would say. And I was an athlete, so people were always like, be aggressive, and I was like, deal. <laughs> uh, I, to directly quote something my mom said to my coach, Elena is as mean as a snake. <laughs> and I called her the other day to confirm that quote, and she said, I was making you look better than you were. And I was like, oh, <laughs> okay. Um, yes, I didn't really mind being perceived that way because I kind of liked that people knew not to mess with me. It felt empowering to me. When I got to college, I really started diving into my faith, and one of the first things I memorized was a verse in uh, Philippians 4 that says, let your gentleness be evident to all. But I had no idea what that practically looked like. I knew it probably did not entail squishing my, my sister's face or like inspiring fear in my basketball opponents, uh, but that's about all I knew. So in a genuine attempt to cultivate gentleness, I kind of would just get withdrawn and quiet. Mm. Or I would like laugh things off, maybe repress them a little bit. Because I just had no idea what to do with my frustrations and my hurt. Or even sometimes my like intense excitement. Like I didn't know what to do with that. It felt off limits. Because I didn't want to cause a scene. I didn't want to ruffle feathers. <laughs> I didn't want to potentially hurt anyone. My definition of gentleness was just to appear super pleasant regardless of what I was feeling. Mm. Like that is what I came up with. Um, as per usual, I was wrong. <laughs> and just super wrong. The definition of gentleness cannot be just appear super pleasant regardless of what you're feeling. Mm. Jesus ruffled every feather known to man. <laughs> he literally flipped tables in Matthew 21. But we know from Curtis's talk last week that God's character is consistent 100% of the time. He is always good and there's never a time he deviates from that. And Morgan mentioned he has perfect joy even in the midst of deep grief. The Lord truly seems like a walking juxtaposition. <laughs> so he can fully exhibit gentleness while flipping a table. How? <laughs> How did he do that? What was he calling us to? And how do we live into it? Protes, I don't know if I'm saying it right. I tried, I listened to the translation. I don't know, protes 
describes an internal attitude more than just an external behavior. You know, we like to focus on the external. We like to think like, if I can just behave this way, that'll be good. But God is not about trying to manage behavior. He's about transforming our heart. The internal shift will lead to the external behavior. So my definition of gentleness was super flawed. Being able to appear nice, even though I was like raging inside, uh, that is not gentleness. And, and pretending to be gentle is never going to transform mm. my heart. Just like we can't plant an apple tree in some dry soil and be like, all right, tree, make this soil good. <laughs> we, we cultivate the soil first and we say, that'll lead to good fruit. We cannot invert the steps. Try as we might, <laughs> we cannot invert those steps. The internal needs to happen before the external. So a more accurate definition of gentleness is the evenness of a spirit that is not preoccupied with self. The evenness of spirit, so it's not volatile. There's a steadiness in your spirit because you're not preoccupied with your own self-interest. That's not the point. That's not what you're fixated on. Gentleness is, a, is not a personality trait. It's a perspective that we cultivate. Mm -hmm. So we're going to look at 1 Peter 3 to gain some insight about how to cultivate that spirit. And for context, this is a letter that Peter, one of Jesus' closest disciples, wrote to encourage Christians who are suffering due to their faith. Starting in verse 13. Now who will want to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you suffer for doing what's right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. If someone asks you about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed because they'll be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. Remember, it's better to suffer for doing good if it's what God wants than to suffer for doing wrong. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but was raised to life in the spirit. We're not going to be able to unpack all that. We're going to just unpack a little bit. I would say that the first step to cultivating gentleness is actually recognizing the power Jesus has given us. The first step is recognizing the power Jesus has given us. And if we look back um, to the beginning of that verse, it says, even if you suffer for doing what's right, God's going to reward you for it. So don't worry. Don't be afraid. Instead, worship Christ as <clears throat> Lord. So our power comes from recognizing Jesus is Lord of our life. And this is a profound relational declaration. To say Jesus is Lord is to acknowledge that he is the one we belong to. Mm. That is what it means to be Lord, is you belong to that. So something will always be Lord of our lives. <laughs> uh, you know, whatever or whomever we worship is going to be our Lord. Whatever we're using to measure our worth or determine our value, whatever we're using to direct our steps, like whatever thing we've decided, they get to dictate that. That's what's Lord. That's what we belong to. Mm. So when we say Jesus is Lord, we're saying he gets authority over my identity. You know, I, uh, or Curtis made me this ring at LT made me this little ring. Oh. I get to decide how much this ring is worth. This is my ring. <laughs> I could say this is worth a million dollars. And then Courtney could say that ring is garbage. Curtis did a crap job. It's, it's, it's mean. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even see it. 
but it doesn't matter if Courtney has determined the value is different than me because it's it's my ring <laughs> so I get to decide mm. and that is what it's like with Jesus is Lord we are saying that he is the one that gets to determine our value and he said that we're enough we are valuable enough to literally get off the throne come to earth live as a human and die for like our value is immense to him we are precious to him and so we don't have to work for our value or our identity we are safe from an opinion that would otherwise that, that would say otherwise yeah. that's what it means for jesus to be lord and since we belong to him since he is lord he also has the most authority to guide us and we may pull back at the thought of that I don't want anyone to be able to control what I do, but we regularly give things authority over us. You know, school, they tell you, do this assignment, mm -hmm. take these classes. <clears throat> You've given them some authority over you. Your parents, your friends, if you're trying to get their approval or live up to their standards, You've given them authority over you. This baby, when it wants three egg rolls, I'm like, deal. Mm -hmm. eat three egg rolls. <laughs> it has authority. <laughs> so by submitting to the standards or expectations of these things, we're giving them some authority over us. But when we say Jesus is Lord, we're saying that you, God, have the ultimate authority over me. More than school, more than my parents, more than my desires. I trust you to direct my steps and bless the outcomes, which is a very powerful place to be. Now keep in mind that, that many followers in Jesus' time were being imprisoned and beaten and even murdered. It was common enough that Peter wrote this letter of encouragement. So this wasn't just like a, ah, eh, you may get some pushback. People may not like you. Like lives were at stake. And Peter is saying that even in that, we don't have to be afraid because Jesus is Lord. He's Lord over death. Death didn't defeat him, and it's not gonna defeat those who belong to him. Our eternity started once we began a relationship with him, so our life isn't gonna end when these bodies pass away. So what do we have to fear? We are, we are safe. And I wrote these in I statements because I think they're very powerful to say over ourselves. Um, to say, Jesus, you are Lord of my life. You have authority over my identity. You have authority over my steps. Nothing else can control me or defeat me. I am safe because you are Lord. Jesus is Lord, so we have the power to do what's right regardless of how other people respond. And we trust that a reward from the Lord is more powerful than any suffering the world may throw at us. And many of you know how much I wrestle with that idea. I hate feeling like I'm trying to do what's right and it results in my own suffering. That is not ideal for me. <laughs> uh, like when my ex and I broke up in college, I, at first I was determined to keep it classy and cordial. We were gonna be fine. Um, but when I went home for break, a few of my friends were being super weird to me. <laughs> and I realized he had just been trash talking me, like making up lies and sharing it to my friends. And these were friends I had known since middle school. Like I thought, there's no way they'd be swayed, but they were. Mm. But in that season, I was very aware of the Lord's power, and I was determined not to retaliate. My ex had no power over me. I was not going, or I was going to do what was right regardless of how they responded. And I was going to trust that the Lord was going to reward me until there was a game night, and we ended up at the same place, and this girl came up to me and said, oh, you're that Elena? And I was like, all right. That's enough. That, is enough. <laughs> that was my breaking point. I was so tired of people perceiving me uh, negatively, and I wanted to use every bit of power I could muster to just eviscerate his character. That even this spirit that I had been feeling was just gone. <laughs> I decided to fight sin with sin. I was going to make him look like a fool, like he had made me look like a fool. And I don't remember how exactly I did that, but I know it was effective at embarrassing <laughs> him, and I remember rejoicing over that. <laughs> and that, guys, is not the power of Jesus being Lord of my life. That is the result of forgetting my identity. That is the result of being controlled by the opinion of others, giving people more authority over me than God did. That is the exact opposite of Jesus' power. Jesus was gentle. He was not preoccupied with himself. 
and it allowed him to be accused of false crimes, to be mocked mercilessly, and to be hung on a cross with an even spirit. And even while he was on the cross, you know, suffering, it's hard to breathe up there, it like crushes your lungs. Even while struggling for breath, he cried out, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. That leads us to our second step in cultivating gentleness. The second step in cultivating gentleness is submitting our power to God's purpose. You know, it only took me a couple months of being trash talked <laughs> before I was like, all right, I'm gonna destroy you. Jesus, on the other hand, was willing to endure prolonged suffering on our behalf. Because, or in verse 18, it says, <clears throat> He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. Jesus had the infinite resources of God at his command, and he used them to bring us safely home to God. His spirit was not swayed by rejection or accusation because he was not concerned with protecting his image or getting even. He wasn't preoccupied with himself. He submitted 100% of his power to God's purpose. Bring my people safely back to me. Bring them home. In cultivating gentleness, that's what we need to do. We need to cultivate an evenness of spirit that is preoccupied with bringing others back, safely back to God. Because we already know that we're safe, right? We already have that. Because Jesus is Lord, we get to expect goodness. We get to expect God to, to use what's being done in evil and transform it for our good. We get to hope and there's nothing the world can do to take that from us, which is different than how the rest of the world lives. You know, we should crave that for them. I want that freedom and goodness for you. So if someone asks you about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it, but do this in a gentle and respectful way. If someone asks you, and they probably will, because this is a weird thing that we're able to do, to hope in the midst of suffering. If they ask you, how can you do that? Be ready to explain it. And not just by saying, well, this is what the Bible says. <laughs> uh, you know, explain how you personally have been met in your sin and in your brokenness, and how Jesus gently walked you back to God, brought you back into safety back to the God of love and mercy and hope, even though we didn't deserve it. Share your story. It has the power to transform lives. And it's amazing how often I hear people say, oh, my testimony isn't cool. Mm. That, that phrase, man, that can't be true. That is a lie from the enemy that can never be true because it's crazy that God fought so hard to be in relationship with us, that he never sinned and died to be reconciled with the very people who sinned against him. It's an astounding story. It has immense power. So I'd like to never hear you guys say that your story is not cool. So we share our powerful hope in a gentle and respectful way, not trying to bully people into agreeing with our perspective or prove a point. We are an even spirit that is preoccupied with bringing others safely back to God. And I hope it's encouraging to remember we have the same access to God's power that Jesus did. So if he could advocate on behalf of the people who literally murdered him, we have the power to advocate on the behalf of those we disagree with, the people who annoy us, the people who hurt us, <laughs> the people who are intentionally wronging us. In gentleness, we recognize our power and use it to help bring others to Christ. I do want to clarify that gentleness is different than being a doormat. We talked about how gentleness doesn't siege power for our own self-interest. It's not preoccupied with our own benefit. But it also doesn't encourage us to forfeit power out of fear. Remember, we're not trying to be like I was at the beginning. We're not trying to just appear super likable and make sure no one gets mad or no one's feelings get hurt. We don't cause a scene. All of that is motivated by fear. Instead, we, we recognize our power and we use it correctly. 
We see an example of this when Jesus flipped tables in Matthew 21. Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out all the people buying and selling animals for sacrifice. He knocked over the tables of money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. And he said to them, the scriptures declare, my temple will be called a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. So this happened during Passover, which is a huge holiday for the Jews to celebrate their liberation from Egypt. So people are flocking from all over the place to go to the temple. It would have been packed. So people, the people selling doves, they seized an opportunity. They were like, let me set up um, a place to sell doves at outrageously high prices for people to sacrifice. Think trying to buy concessions at a Penn State game. Like it, there's no reason to pay that much for a bottle of water. That's what they were doing. They were like, I'm gonna seize this opportunity to make some money. So you think Jesus would be upset just by the sellers, just by the people who were charging outrageous prices. Um, but his anger was directed at both the buyers and the sellers. But why? Like, why was he so upset about that? He said, the scriptures declare, my temple will be called a house of prayer. That's referencing Isaiah 56, where he says, my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations. He says, I will bring back the outcasts of Israel, and I'll bring others too, besides my people of Israel. So Jesus is saying, I'm, bringing, I'm trying to bring the outcasts in, the people that you don't usually let in your temple. I'm also trying to bring in outsiders, foreigners, people you don't allow in the temple. And those people were only allowed in the outer court of the temple where the market was set up. So they had crowded it so much that no one else could get in. These people were taking up all the space and it made it impossible for any non-Jewish non person, a Gentile, any foreigner and any outcast to come and pray. Jesus flipped tables because he wanted everyone to have the ability to approach the Lord. It didn't contradict his gentleness. His spirit was preoccupied with bringing others safely back to him. He wasn't volatile. He wasn't trying to condemn people. He was intentionally using his power to advocate for others. And that is a great act of gentleness. So yeah, we're not, we're not coming in like a wrecking ball or <laughs> that's not gentleness, but we're also not being a doormat. We have to be preoccupied, not with self, but with bringing others back to the Lord. And that is how we embody gentleness. So we're gonna take some time to just discuss together. I know this is a lot. Um, how does this line up with your understanding of gentleness? I mean, did you grow up being told to be gentle? And this, like, what did that mean to you? <laughs> what does this mean to you uh, in comparison? And then are you more prone to siege power for your own benefit or forfeit power out of fear? Keep in mind, neither of those are, are gentle. Um, how might God be calling you to respond in gentleness instead?